call. Well, <laughs> he's been working awfully hard, you know. I'm Terry Kaiser. Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> We're having a digital fan event September 27th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be doing a Q&A at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you can watch it on, well, YouTube or Facebook. Following the Q&A, you can have a one-on-one -on -one video. Meet and greet me on Zoom. It's fantastic! <laughs> Autographs and video greetings are also available. Hi, Bernie. I hear you've got something for me. A little present. For information, you can visit www. Full Empire Promotions dot com. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you there. Come on. Let's talk to Bernie. He can talk. <laughs> I'm Barbara Crampton. Please join me for my first ever digital fan event on September 26th. Her request brought a lot of dead people back to life. And not one of them showed any appreciation. I will be doing a Q&A that streams live to Facebook and YouTube. You can have a one-on-one -on -one video meet and greet on Zoom. Where is she? Oh, good morning. The little angel is sleeping. Come, come eat. I made you some soup. Ready? Autographs and video recordings also available. So let's get to it. Because of the heat, we only run that sucker through the night. The graveyard shift. Freeze! You move it, I'll kill you! Oh, hurry it up! Get out of here!
Hey everyone, welcome to another Full Empire Promotions live event. We're live on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Dominic. I'll be your host for this special Q&A with Stephen Mott. Thanks so much to everyone who's watching us live. If you'd like to ask Stephen any comments or leave any questions, please do so, and uh, we'll get to those during the broadcast. This is your first time joining us for an event. Uh, thanks so much for checking it out, and I uh, hope you'll stick around. If you're returning, uh, thanks for coming back. Before I bring Stephen on, I do want to let you know that following this Q&A, you can have your own private conversation with Stephen. He'll be doing one-on-one -on -one video meet and greets on Zoom. So if you're interested in that, you can go to fullempirepromotions.com and click on his ad, and that'll take you right into the uh, store so you can book your session. You'll have five minutes to talk with Stephen about whatever you'd like, and uh, we'll even send you a recording of it so you can have that uh, forever, you know, as a memory. And also, you can get uh, personally signed uh, photos and posters and all kind of stuff from Stephen on that website, as well as recorded video greetings. So once again, fullempirepromotions.com for all your Stephen Mock needs. Well, it's time to bring on our special guest. Uh, he has over 100 credits in TV, film, and theater. His film's credits include The Monster Squad, Galaxina, Stephen King's Graveyard Shift, The Mountain Men, Nightwing, Amityville, It's About Time, and Trancers 3 through 5. His popular TV credits include appearances on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Cagney and Lacey, General Hospital, Knott's Landing, and most recently playing Professor Gerard on the hit series Suits. It's my honor to welcome a talented actor, gifted teacher, and a great friend, Mr. Stephen Mott. Hey, hey, Dominic. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for that intro, and thanks for the, you know, those promos. They were, the cuttings were great. Oh, what, glad, all kinds of memories. Glad you liked it. You know, it could be impossible to fit all your stuff in there, but but uh, <laughs> got some juicy ones. <laughs> so, how have you been? How, how's the weather in uh, California? The weather is great. You know, it's 80, 85 degrees. Um, you know, if it weren't for COVID, this would be just wonderful and it's similar all over the world but we're fine i'm hunkering down and um this pro this this um interview and the and the zoom and the virtual reality has provided us all a way out to connect it's great and i and i gotta thank you for doing that dom it's really great really good yeah no my pleasure it's it's fun well i do want to start off uh with your background a little bit you were born in philadelphia uh, from what i understand did you did you grow up there no dom i i um it was one year i lived there and then my parents moved to brooklyn new york okay. my father was a um a regional attorney for the national labor relations board you know it's back then in the 40s he had graduated summa cum laude out of the University of Virginia Law School, and as a Jew from the South, he went to New York to try to get a job in um, corporate America, but they weren't hiring Jews at the time. So he went to work for the government, and he became a trial judge and an attorney for the National Labor Relations Board, so a mediator between corporate greed and uh, the labor movement that was in its nascent period. So I was raised, actually, in Brooklyn, until I was nine years old. Oh, great. Did you watch films growing up? Were you a film fan? Well, you know, I was like any little kid. My, my parents had, um, you know, they had one of the original televisions. We could go to the Clark Street Cinema, which uh, in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn Heights, uh, or we could go to the Tivoli and pay five cents to see a movie. <laughs> and I really loved all the Westerns, you know, Lone Ranger, all of that stuff. Uh, far be it from me to think that it, it would have developed into a film career and a television career. So that was not part of it. No, I want to be a baseball player. Oh, okay. And I was a big Yankee fan. I was a Dodger fan until they kept losing 
to the Yankees all the time. And then I think when I was about eight, uh, I lived right across the street from the Bossard Hotel, which is where the Dodgers used to come. And that was their home hotel. And they used to lose all the time. And I, I often take my kids whenever I can back to the manhole cover on Hicks Street, which is where when they finally lost again a World Series at the age of about seven or eight, I gave up and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to root for the Yankees from now on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, what came first for you? Was it commercials, theater, or, or film? Well, I think it, it um, you know, I majored, in, I majored in drama at Dartmouth College. And after that, trained in England and then came back and tried my hand, uh, which was not really, I really didn't get any work uh, in New York. So I went and got a PhD in dramatic literature and then came back in 1970, um, 71, and started to get work in commercials, uh, a lot of commercials, uh, Worcestershire sauce, Crest, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then started to do television, episodic television. Uh, I remember this with Richard Widmark. My first one was with Richard Widmark in Madigan. Great actor. Yeah. And that was a, that's a memory I write. I remember I had been in a play on Broadway playing nine lines with uh, Claire Bloom and Eileen Atkins. And I wore uh, Widmark's what Whitmark's vest from a Western that he had been in. And I, as, as a, as, as a, an Elizabethan um, jailer, I had his vest and I couldn't believe that I was wearing uh, Whitmark's vest. And so on my first Madigan thing, I was so in, so in starstruck. All I had, I was an intern. I remember we shot it in, in, in Harlem in a hotel, in a uh, hospital. And all I had to do, he came in, I met him at the nurse's station. And I, he said, you want to see this guy? It's this way. And I pointed and he says, okay, you go first, show me the way. I said, no, no, you. So he goes first. And on the first take, I was so nervous. I stepped on the back of his heel and he tripped <laughs> <laughs> and I tripped. And Gordon Park said, cut. Park said, Stephen, come here, let me talk to you. You're going to be a great actor. Just let Richard go first. Take it easy. It's fine. That's all you got to do. Relax. Let him go first and count three and then follow him. <laughs> that was my introduction, my first, uh, my first introduction to uh, television. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're probably thinking in your head, man, that's going to leave a wet mark. <laughs> right. I, I can't tell you, Dom. It was so, I, I couldn't believe I was sharing the same space. I was a, a young, <laughs> starstruck uh, guy, and you know, soon after, you know, you get over that. But it yeah, was a, a, quite a quite a memory for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, other TV shows that you were in early in your career were uh, included Kojak and uh, yeah. Six Million Dollar Man. You worked alongside yeah. uh, greats like Lee Majors and Telly Savalas. Oh, did you, oh, did you make any? Telly. Yeah, Telly. Telly. You know, tell. I remember coming out, and I, I came out under the Young Star program, signed by Universal Scouts, and it was at the tail end of that program where I was under contract for um, a year, and they put me in television shows. And I remember going to my first one, and the head of that program, her name was Monique James, used to say to me, "Stephen, now listen, don't worry. Telly is going to paste all of his lines." on your chest and on your back. He never learns the lines. He doesn't have, that's why he sucks a lollipop and wears tinted glasses. So don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And I said, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. So uh, I did the first one in California. I played an evil Cain-like son. And then I remember the series went back to New York and they told me, come out you'll play an Indian, a high steel worker who he knows has done a robbery and he knows that you know he that you killed a guy and it's like the, the kojak takeoff of crime and punishment dust the acid crime and punishment right. so there was one scene at the at, at a canal when i'm sitting in the dirt in a brooklyn canal and i think he he's gonna have to learn his lines because i'm sitting down in the dirt 
and with my feet dangling over fishing, but with no hook on my on my the end of my line. Um, so he'll have to learn the lines. It's short, see, maybe ten lines. So the director at that time, Jano Swart, said he was on a uh, a bullhorn across the canal, shooting on a big lens, and he says over the bullhorn. Deli, you got to learn your lines. This is a good actor. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, 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 John, everything is fine. So Telly looks at me. We rehearse. He's rehearsing the lines sitting on an apple crate next to me. Oh, he says, God. yeah, yeah, you, you want me to learn my line. Don't worry, kid. Don't worry. So anyway, <laughs> he says, 10 minutes later, we're ready to shoot. Ready? Action. Telly comes up. He sits next to me on an apple crate. And I think he learned his line, my God. And all of a sudden, from around the corner, comes a rowboat with two ADs. And they have a large broom sticking up to the side with his lines, the big lines pasted on it. And I look at it, and I look at him, and he goes, he, he, he blinks at me, he winks at me, and I said, oh, no, I tell you, you're not going to do this. <laughs> and I hear from Jean Schwartz. Steven, we got to do that over. What's the matter with you? <laughs> so, Telly never learned the lines, but that was, we did the scene. Anyway, it's a story. Yeah, well, you would never know. I mean, Telly was just so naturally gifted that he, you know, he had his own, had his own uh, method. Right. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jano Schwartz is, is, is another great director. You know, he directed Jaws 2 and then went on to do, he still does big TV shows now. Absolutely. I worked with him again on Sliders. Yeah. He directed an episode and his daughter was on that episode. Um, that was a, I, I remember I played some kind of weird Nazi-like guy in some other galaxy that the Sliders happened to slip right. into. Um, but he was, he's a, he's a very good director and a very charming warm warm guys so we shared all that background at universal together yeah very cool well yeah. a film that i enjoyed uh, that isn't talked about much is uh raid on on to be uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it uh, listen to this cast uh, it had charles bronson yafet koto john saxon jack warden robert loja james woods and of course stephen mocked uh, uh, wow i mean that, uh, any connections from from uh, being on set with so many great actors at the same time. Oh, yeah. It was a, you know, that what that really broke it open for me. Um, I remember... Um, Where was it filmed? The woman, who, the woman who cast me, Monique James, I couldn't get in to meet Irv Kirshner, who later directed Star Trek, uh, one, of the, one of the films. Uh, and anyway, she called the casting director and got me a meeting with him. And at that time, I was the young Jewish guy who had come out. And I had a background similar to Yoni Netanyahu. I have a, had a PhD. Yoni studied um, He uh, studied at Harvard. So Kirshner said to me, you know, let's have a talk. He said, I, I know that you have a background in the Greeks, in Aristotle. So let's talk all about that. And I said, OK, great. Let's talk about that. Um, and you know, we talked about Greek tragic heroes and the death of them and uh, recompense. And then he said to me, listen, Stephen, you got a lot of edges and I love it. I love it. But you got to be careful. You come to Hollywood and you're new in Hollywood. He said, you're going to be like, you're like a jagged stone. They're going to put you inside of a Hollywood, a, a Japanese polishing machine. And inside of two, three years, they're going to smooth out all your edges <laughs> and you're going to come out. Wow. Move stone. Be look out. So I looked at him and I said, why are you telling me this? I'm a young actor here. I'm, I got edges. I don't want your damn role. And I started to leave. He said, no, wait, wait, look, I'm just warning you. I said, you're like Judas. You're like saying you're praising me on the one hand and saying that this is going to happen. On the other hand, he said, I'm just warning you, man. That's all. I'm going to give you the role. But watch out. So <laughs> that was the one that was it. And, you know, he was absolutely right. Besides, you know, when in television, you work very quickly. Right. And as a young actor, you tend to repeat yourself. So when you do episodic television, 
I, after a while, three, you know, two, three years into it, I started to lose all the edges that I had come out with, my anger, and I was just churning it out. I think in the in in between time, I studied with some great teachers yes. who let me reclaim my career and let me investigate exactly what makes me who I am speaking to you right now. Uh, so that was a major event. I also had, I remember a, an event with Bronson. Bronson was a, I spent two days at the Van Nuys Air Force Base waiting to meet him before I went on. Is, that, went, where it was, is that where it was filmed? The, the, the Van Nuys? The, the original attack rehearsal stuff was all at the Van Nuys Air Force Base. And then up in Stockton, okay, they did a mock-up of the um of of the Entebbe airport so we went up there and shot for two weeks as well okay but meeting bronson i remember talking about kojak in the middle of the first scene that i had with him well first when i finally met him i waited for two days and the ad finally comes to me he says we're walking over across the airfield come on you'll meet bronson so as i meet bronson i put my hand out to meet him and I said, Mr. Bronson, I'm Steve Mom. He takes my hand. He goes like that. Hey, how are you? And he walked off. So cut two days later, we're in the first scene. And uh, <laughs> the camera runs out of uh, film. And I'm across from him in a ping pong table with the mock-up of the airport where I get the command. And in the middle of the scene, while Kirshner is film is uh, putting more film in the can, Bronson looks at me and he says, hey, you know who you look like? And I said, who? And he says, Deli Savalas. <laughs> so I start to walk over to him and Kirshner says, wait, Stephen, wait. I said, no, 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 it's fine. And I come up to him and I said, Charlie, you know, they, you know who they say I really look like? He says, who? I said, Charlie Bronson. <laughs> he says to me, what do you want to look like me for? I looked and I, I shook his hand and shaking his hand. I said, because my wife told me to tell you that when I meet you, I should shake your hand a hundred times because that's how much more money you're earning than I am, you dummy. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and says, hey, you're all right, man. Come on in my trailer after this scene. You're on Amelia Earhart. We'll watch the film together. That's great. He was something else. He was, you know, he just was there. He didn't like people. Yeah, you know, he had friends, but he was he was shy. He would talk, he talked about tales that he was a tail gunner in World War II. He really had a lot going on. Uh, so he was that guy. He was the guy whose edges were always there. Yeah, for sure. And and oddly <laughs> enough. Before early in his acting career, uh, Andy Devoff was his limo driver. Bronson. I never knew that. I yeah. knew. Andy never told me that. My yeah. God, right. I never yeah. knew that. Yeah, and he said no. the same thing. He was a character. He really was. Yes. Andrew Devoff, Red Yacht yeah. Ship. <laughs> well, that was one of his first roles. Yeah, it was. It was. Well, if anybody wants to check out Raid on Antibi, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. That's a great film. A yeah, it's a really good film. Um, it is. I hear of the three or four raids, that was the most, uh, except for the Israeli one that they made, that was closest to what really happened there. That was a right. was really something for me to be in that. Peter Finch, uh, who was a great, great English actor. I remember when we first screened it at the Academy, I walked in and here were all those stars that you mentioned. As I walked in, Peter Finch came up to me and he shook my hand. He said, young man, you know, I know your work. I said, you know my work. My God, I know your work. He said, no, no, no. After this film, there are going to be many more people who know your work. Congratulations. It's one of the biggest compliments I ever got from wow. Peter Finch. Very he cool. He played Rabin in that, in, that, in that film. He died maybe two or three years later, so I never got to work with him again, but he was really a classy guy, a classy Great actor. memory. Yeah. Well, your first venture uh, in the horror genre came in 1979 with the film Nightwing. Uh, were you a fan of the horror genre? 
and, and how did this all come about? You know, Dom, we, we chatted a little bit about this before. You know, I came off the Shakespeare stage. I was signed uh, at a Stratford, Ontario Shakespeare Festival by Universal. So my training comes in, you know, big parts, really big parts, you know, stage parts. And for me, the closest thing to Shakespeare and Shakespeare's uh, peers during the Renaissance is the genre of horror. Because, you know, there are good guys and bad guys in horror movies, not necessarily in Shakespeare, but the largeness. In Shakespeare, they're all tragic characters. But it gave me, the horror genre for me was a place where it could withhold big, big emotions that I was having. You remember, we're going back now 30, 30 years, so I was a much younger man. Yeah. I think I've calmed down a little bit. <laughs> so when I was offered these roles in the horror genre, it was, I had to mute the feelings that I had, but I loved the big issues that were at stake. So in Nightwing, you know, I was playing the, the Indian, the modern Indian who sold out his tribe and was selling oil rights right off of the land. And, uh, you know, I was Gucci-fied. I remember I got all kind of Gucci clothing. I had the Indian necklace and I was making deals. Um, somehow, uh, Nick Mancuso and I were up for the lead role and he got that one because they felt he had more edges <laughs> by that time and I was smoother. So yeah. I played the Indian, you know, the, the really smooth Indian. Right. Uh, right. So that was my introduction, and, and Arthur Hiller directed that one. Yes. Also worked with David Warner on that. That's right. We met there. David and I met, and I had seen David as a Shakespeare actor when I first went abroad and trained, and he was playing lead roles in Stratford, uh, in Stratford, England. And so I really, really admired him as an actor. Yeah, he's great. He's great. Well, you went on to play another Indian uh, in a film after that called The Mountain Men with John <laughs> Heston and John Glover. Was this uh, a physically demanding role? Ah, Dom, I got a million stories from that. You know, I had met Heston in A Man for All Seasons at the Amundsen. I met him and we became real friends and he became a mentor of mine. And so he, he said to me halfway through, he said, listen, I know you played an Indian in Nightwing and you've done Kojak. You want to play a real Indian? One who rides horseback? Can you ride? I said, what do you mean, can I ride? Of course I can ride. You ask an actor if he can ride. So he says, I, I, know, I trust you, Stephen, but just in case, you should go and train uh, out in uh, Simi Valley with our stunt rider. And because you're going to have to ride a big horse. So I went out there. Or at we, you know, we performed at, in the evening, the Man for All Seasons. I played Henry V. Uh, and anyway, um, okay, King Henry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so as I trained, you know, I was in my sweatpants, and I had to mount this horse that was 17 hands high that came up to here, the saddle, or bareback here. And I finally learned how to mount it. And I could do that and ride. I learned how to ride. But when it came to the... When it came to the first shot, and we shot in north of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in the Tetons, I remember my first shot, and everybody was there. Heston was watching, and all. I had six Indians all on horseback. I had to come out of a teepee, run across um, snow field about 15 yards. It was up to my knees, and jump on this horse, get a rifle. Jeez. And my, my father would say to me, uh, you black your face because I had black Indian mark. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, for the hunt. And I would ride off. That's all I had to do, one line. So the story was the customer told me, listen, it's very cold up there, Steve. You should wear long johns, put that under, and we're going to put all the leather on you. And they put a bow and arrow on my back. They gave me a whip. And when I came out of my teepee, I could hardly walk. <laughs> I was I was just in. So by the time I got across, first of all, I slipped in the snow and everybody goes, oh. and I said, okay, it's all right. It's all right. Take two. I'll go back. And as I get to the horse on take two, I can hardly move. I'm huffing and puffing. 
So I say to the director, Richard, it was Richard Lang. I said, Richard, have you got, don't you have a Kirk Douglas trampoline here? <laughs> and on a bullhorn, because he was off about 15 yards and shooting on a long lens, he, I hear, there is not a Kirk Douglas trampoline in the whole state of Wyoming, Stephen. <laughs> oh, God. And everybody's laughing. And I see Heston laughing off to the side. And finally, the I'm all, you know, warm, but the Indians are getting a coverage of about a quarter inch of snow all over them. <laughs> and one of the Indians looks at me as I walk back, and he says to me, Heavy eagle, huh? <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I say to him, don't you worry, man. When I get on his horse, the money is right here. <laughs> it's going to be right here. It took me, I think, probably another. I mean, there's a lot of funny stuff about that. I couldn't. Yeah. They had to build a ramp. I slipped on the ramp. It was ice. And finally, I made it. So it's, a shame, uh, it's a shame you didn't know Wilford Brimley then. I, know, it, it was just something. So finally, and Heston left after probably three or four takes laughing. And finally I go back and I meet all the other stunt guys in the bar after it's over. I'm ashamed, I face them and they, they clap when I come in and they said, don't you know, we do that for you. Why didn't you ask us? We <laughs> I said, oh, I didn't even know we could do that. <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm your stunt guy. I said, you got the job from now on. So I let him do that. Meanwhile, I practiced writing and, and the so the penultimate pride of that film for me was the last shot of me and Heston coming at one another from a, you know, a big yeah. uh, wide angle. I was, I learned to ride that horse and mount that horse. And I was riding that horse over a rocky water Creek in my village, no hands, totally bareback. And the, the film shows us crossing, but we shot that a thousand yards coming together and crossing maybe eight times. And I felt just, total command because I practiced writing for about six weeks doing that. And then after that was over, the stunt guys took over where the horses actually bang one another and then we stage a fight. And I felt I, after I finished and they printed it, I ran up to the, to the same costumer and I said, you know, I finally have become heavy eagle. He said, I saw it. You are heavy eagle. <laughs> you are. You earned it. Anyway, so that was a... Yeah, a great job. Great film. Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Galaxina. You did cool. that in 1980. Uh, right. William Sachs, the director, created a, uh, a zany and fun sci-fi movie. How did you approach this role? Did you approach it uh, a, a serious tone or comical or kind of between both? But just fun. I just, you know, <laughs> it was, again, it was, a, it was a B movie. I read it. It gave me a chance to... Uh, you know, be the leading guy, um, and to act opposite Dorothy Stratton. They told right. me the, the playgirl, and she, you know, she just she she actually turned twenty during the shooting of that film, uh, and she was just a, a lovely, lovely uh, woman, and reminded me very much of my high school first love. I mean, just a beautiful, beautiful girl, uh, and she was. I told, you know, I've told this before. The first time I met her was at a costume uh, appointment in a, um, in a, uh, the costume had a home, a, a, a Spanish type home, but up in a loft uh, was, was her work area. And I met Dorothy and Dorothy at that time had a young sister who must have been, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. And Dorothy had an appointment before me. And as I came in, we shook hands and, she, and they said, Dorothy, they're ready for you. She picked up her sister and ran up those stairs with her carrying her. And I thought to myself, wow. oh, my God, that's a strong gal. I, yeah. I, to this day, I remember that. She, was, she had tremendous spirit, had tremendous energy, and had a very quiet sense, lovely sense of who she was. And it was just a lot of fun. So I enjoyed all of that, you know, all of that, the whole idea of a robot becoming human yeah. because she fell in love with me. <laughs> and so it was all tongue in cheek during that time. And, and Bill Sachs had a great sense of humor. Yes. Avery Schreiber was there. 
And we just were allowed to improvise a lot of stuff. And we were constantly laughing, constantly having fun on that. Um, you know. Um, yeah, I think it was one of the early sci-fi spoof kind of films. That yeah, it was, a, it was a spoof on Star Trek. Right. You know, it was just a, a total spoof. I paid this handsome, you know, uh, sub-captain, Sergeant Thor, uh, who falls in love with a robot and, <laughs> you know, conquers space. It was really, right. really, really, it was a lot of fun shooting it. And I was just sorry to hear what happened to her yeah. in between, you know, after finishing that and going on to shoot with Peter Bogdanovich and other stuff. Uh, and she was quite a, a very simple, really sweet, lovely, lovely actress. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame uh, she didn't have a longer career, but... This yep. short career she did have, people remember. So Absolutely. It's great. Yep. Well, throughout the 80s, you went on to guest star in many popular TV shows, such as Hill Street Blues, Scarecrow and Mrs. King, yeah. Everett Hitchcock Presents, and Cagney and Lacey. Yeah. Uh, did you enjoy doing uh, TV work over film work? Did you have a preference at the time? No, it wasn't. It, it, it just, you know, when you if you come in Hollywood, at the time, Universal held the lion's share of television all those series that you met you the you know uh six million dollar man kingston confidential quincy okay. um they were all shot at universal yeah. so i was put into those things in order to learn the craft and part of my contract was that i owed universal a pilot and one of the spin-off episodes of the six million dollar man was an episode called the data man it was one of the first episodes where, you know, they could, they, <laughs> they dreamt up this plot where this university professor, young guy, could be hooked up to a machine and his brain electronically could be uh, wired with all the pertinent information ever, ever needed to be known. And we shot that and it aired and it scored like third in the week. And they then used that as my pilot. Um, it did not sell. Um, so I went on to do a lot of other stuff for them. Right. I started the mini series, the immigrants where I actually met Sharon Gless. That was the first thing we did. And that was at universal. And so that, that began a long friendship with Sharon, uh, who I ultimately then met on Cagney and Lacey with Barney Rosenzweig, who was the executive producer of a series that I did a really wonderful series called The American Dream mm -hmm. that we can talk about in juxtaposition to Star Trek when that came up. Right. Um, but Sharon and I were both under contract at Universal. So she became my leading lady, you know, the queen, the Knob Hill queen who marries below her a uh, an Italian immigrant who has great aspirations to build um, a shipping empire. And then they fall out of love, and I fall back in love with a, a Chinese gal. So we did that series together. And it was from that that uh, our relationship spawned with Barney in Cagney and Lacey later. And then ultimately, she and I did a play together in San Francisco. Uh, and we've always become friends. Um, we've always been friends. Uh, Barney was a major factor in my life because he did that series, American Dream. And when Ned Beatty didn't work out their first cast, Barney hired me. So I became the lead in that series. And that was a marker series. Uh, it didn't succeed on the air because it came up against spelling. Right. Uh, and they chose because spelling had five or six on the air. And we did five, six, and they showed four. But it was really at that time in the 80s when, you know, gasoline was, lines were all filled up. And that's when people started moving back into the city. And it talks about a reexamination of American values, which would be really pertinent today, mind you. Yes. Um, it was long ahead of its time. And that's, that's where I, I solidified my relationship with Barney who then went on to do Calvin and Lacey. And that's why he put me together with Sharon during that run as her boyfriend. But always told me, 
Well, well that's Maybe Hollywood. Her. I said, Bonnie, I'm right for her. We have a history. He said, no, you're not going to marry her. She <laughs> has to be a woman who is a single woman. I want people all over the world to know that women don't have to get married. I said, all right, listen. Anyway. Well, I found that that's what Hollywood really is. You know, it's making the connections and lining up your next gig. So That's it. Yep. Well, the role that most fans know you from is a film called The Monster Squad. Uh, yeah. You played uh, Dell, you know, the dad and the cop in the film. Right. Uh, I understand this is the easiest role you've ever gotten. Yes, Dominic, it was. I My agent sent me in for this, and you remember Peter Hyams was the executive producer. Right. And I was sitting in there in the room with Fred Decker and Shane Black, who wrote it, and Decker was to direct it. Black was the writer. They wrote it together, and there was Peter Hyam. And I walked in, and Hyam said to me, Stephen, you know why you're here? I said, yeah, I'm going to audition for the part. He said, no, you're, no, you're not. You're here because my wife loves you. I said, what? I never met your wife. She said, doesn't matter. He said, it doesn't matter. He saw the American dream where you played a wonderful father. It's too bad that series never went. But anyway, I'm going to offer you the role. You want to play this dad? And I said, you're offering me the role? He said, yeah, you got the role. You want? I said, yeah, sure. He said, all right, goodbye. I'll see you in two weeks when we start shooting. And that was the, that was. But also, you know, I, I, by that time, I had four kids. Right. You know, my wife, Suzanne, and I have four children. And listen, I <laughs> have been taught a lot about a sort of sense of, to have a sense of humor about myself from my children, and I was right for that part. That came along at, that, at the right time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you, you must have went on to your neck gig, next gig and found, wanted to find a producer that, you know, their wives liked you too. <laughs> right. Lining up your gigs. Uh, did you get along well with Fred Decker? Oh, absolutely. Fred and I, you know, he he, he really had his hands full with the kids. It was, you know, our scenes – were very, you know, kind of simple. And and Fred has a very dry, wonderful sense of humor. All with me, he would just say, Stephen, less is more. Just say the words. You'll be great. And um, you know, shut your shut your lid, the was <laughs> the famous line to to Andre. Um so I was able to find that kind of sardonic cop. But one of the great scenes which was which I never thought I thought it was going to be more of was Mary Ellen Trainer and I had a real argument scene, mm -hmm. where, you know, the traditional scene where the wife says you all your time you spend as a cop, right. you're not a father, you're never home, and a big argument. And I thought there would be more of that scene. Little did I know, it's really shot from the point of view of our son Andre Gower mm -hmm. through slats into the kitchen, so of all the raging and all the emotional stuff just was heard off stage and um, none of that got on well, just as well because it's really about you know the, the the kids in the monster squad right well that 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 scene is actually on the uh, blu-ray as a deleted scene so you can it watch that like, oh I yeah. didn't I'll have to look at that yeah the whole scene is on there if you and Mary Ellen oh wow know, can... she was a terrific actress you know we've shared and a lot of the cons yeah she, she was, was a friend uh, sure. And a lovely, lovely woman. You know, too bad she passed away. She was a and a really good actress. She was great. I she miss really her. Was. I miss Me her too. at all the times. Yep. Well, Stan Winston did the the monster effects on the film. Uh, right. Do you remember your first reaction when you saw all the actors in costume? I couldn't. I think the thing that comes back to me most was again my young son, who's now thirty seven, Jesse, singer songwriter Jesse. Look him up. Mm -hmm. uh, jessemockmusic.com he was four years old when we shot that and it was around Halloween and I'll never it's that scene where I have a, a confrontation with Wolfman and he throws me against you know in a shoebox store or whatever he throws me against all of the, the walls and I come tumbling down and then ultimately I get a stick of dynamite I've carried it and the son bats him in the head and I stick the dynamite and I say, suck on this, you son of a bitch and push him out of the window. And Jesse was standing off 
in that scene behind the camera watching that and shoving them out. And then you hear an explosion outside of a window that was, uh, you know, they did for an effect. And the next scene, we all lined up. It was on the street, a street scene where the pieces of Wolfman come together. Now, that was not done by computer graphics. That was the old way to shoot it. You know, little wires pull the stuff together. And Jesse and I were standing watching Wolfman come together. And I always remember him looking at me and saying, as it was going on, saying, Daddy, how they do that? <laughs> so all that special effects stuff. And I say, shh, shh, shh. And you see it come together. Uh, wow. Yeah. You know, oh, that's funny. It's so so for us, it was it was it was wonderful to see all those guys. I never saw really I saw Duncan every once in a while because I, I only had I never had a real scene with him. He was right. off. You know, when I point the gun at him, he's really off off camera. Uh, and I never said, I never saw uh, Frankenstein. I didn't have right. any scenes with him, uh, except to the end. Um, but one little story, I never, you know, 25 years later, Jesse now, who is, was 29, sees the actor who played Wolfman. What was his name? Uh, John Grise. John, right. He sees John across the street in Hollywood. And he goes over to John and he says, my father would kill me if I didn't say, listen, you played Wolfman. And my father, Stephen Martin, just wanted to say hello. And John, on the spot, says to him, tell him I'm going to kill his son. <laughs> <laughs> Which That's was right. the scene in the telephone booth. Yeah. When he was morphing into Wolfman. Jesse broke up and he broke up and just left. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. great. And, uh, yeah, Carl Thibault played the Wolfman in costume That's most right. of the scenes. That's John right. played the human version That's right, and, and, and the phone booth scene. Yeah. Uh, well, sadly, Monster Squad uh, bombed at the box office. It didn't do very well, but uh, it later it found great success on uh, VHS and DVD. Yep. Uh, what, what do you think it is about the film that keeps attracting so many generations? You know, we have to really tip our hat to Andre Gower. He was the guy who played the lead kid. <laughs> who devoted years to bringing that film back. You know, it was, it was, what, it got a PG rating, PG-13. Why? Because we used a couple of curse words in it. Yeah. But the point was, it was a film that was made for eight to 12, 13 year olds. That's who it was for. So when it opened, we didn't have an audience of those kids to come and see it. So I remember Suzanne and I went to see the opening and, you know, everybody liked it, but within, I don't know, a week or 10 days, it was out of the theaters. It was done. Yeah. So to see Andre go to all kinds of festivals and lug whatever cans he had to do, because it was not, I don't know, VHS at that time, he had a copy of it. I don't know. And he built a following over the years. And then to see the fact that it came back and through all the cons where we met you and I, and to see now generate two or three generations of people who love that film. I, it, it, it made had, several times people used to say to me in open Q and A's, make monster squad too. And I, my answer to that, you know, you can't, I, you can't from my point of view, because it was at the tail end. That was a, a monster movie where, that showed that the kids could really defeat the monsters. It was an idyllic look at that time. Sort of a fun look at that time. Um, and I don't believe you can make it. I told you, you know, every, yeah. when I go to these cons, I now see these little kids come with Jason masks or looking really fierce. And it occurred to me that, you know, the monsters are for real. They're out there. They're in the streets now. They're out there. Uh, the Walking Dead, from my point of view, ain't half as horrible as what's going on in real life. Right. Right. So sure. I think it is a, I, 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 you know, without getting any more politically into it, I just think that that was a film that was right at the end of a time. And I don't think that kind of film can be made again because kids are now past that. 
I think. They are the, they're growing up. If, if their parents don't watch out, they're growing up to be either good fighters or monsters themselves. Anyway. Yeah, for sure. Night. Well, I also think the film, uh, people really didn't know what the film was when it came out. They didn't know if it was a kid's movie or a horror movie. They didn't really, you know, and as you said, the PG-13 rating scared parents away. So, you're but, right. but luckily, uh, you know, it, it gained an audience and it's a, it's a cult favorite now. I love going to, I love going to all the festivals and the cons and talking to those audiences. You know, when I see people, you know, who are now like my son, Jesse is 37. So I meet people like that who have kids. Uh, and some of them, you know, got married early on. Some of them have their kids have grown up and they're now married. So there are generations that have, that have loved that film. And it's a wonderful um, tribute to Shane Black and to Fred Decker and to Peter Hyams and to Andre Gower and everybody who was in that film. Yes. Uh, that it has these legs um, and the values that it talks about, which are to stand for something, to really stand up and, you know, fight the personifications of those monsters. Take a look inside and know that you're not that. You're better than that. Um, anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't want to spend I don't want to spend too much time talking about Graveyard Shift because you've talked about it a lot recently. Uh, uh, there's a, a Blu-ray that came out recently from Shout Factory right. celebrating the 30th anniversary of the film, and, and there's a right. great interview with you on there. Where you talk yeah. about talk about the part of Warwick, uh, uh, right. but I do I do did did want to bring that up because it's one of your fan favorite roles. Sure. Um, sure. No, I just wanted to. I have only one thing to say about that. When I first, you know, uh, Ralph Singleton, who directed it, was the production stage man, production manager on Cagney and Lacey. That's where we met. And so he asked me to do this part when he decided he was going to do that movie. And when I read it, I first thought, I'm not doing this movie. I don't want to do it. So he said to me, why do you want to? I said, because I don't want to be that guy. I'm not that guy. And then I talked it over with my wife, and I, and I was studying with the greatest acting teacher I've ever studied with. Too bad he's gone. Milton Kinsella. And Milton had a phrase. Be very sure why you turn a role down and why you take it. Sometimes when you turn a role down, it's because you have an organ reject. There are things inside of you that you don't want to take a look at. That's a moment when you should pause. Because that's probably the role you need to play. So when I thought about that, I thought that's a chance for me to investigate all the dark side of me. And I'm going to go for it. So that's, in fact, what I did. I told Ralph, I'm not going to talk to any of the the actors. I won't live with them. I'm live aside. He said, don't do it. They'll hate you. I said, all the better. I think the only guy who got that was Andy Debolf, who yeah. saw. Yeah. I really went into a method there. And I developed, I investigated all the dark side of me and played it out. So much so that when it was over and I came home, I wanted to keep my goatee and the short hair. And my wife told me after a week and a half, cut it off. You are not that guy anymore. <laughs> And you're not coming in this bed with that goatee on anymore. So I had to cut it off. Did you keep the accent for a while too? <laughs> I love to come on. You know, people give me such, you know, such service over that accent. I had a wonderful <laughs> main uh, accent guy with me and who checked every line with me. I was the only one who wanted to do it. And I found it was, you know, I loved doing it. And to this day, Gabriel, my, you know, the actor son will call me up and he'll say over the phone out of nowhere. And I say, hello. And he'll just say, show's over. Go back to doing what you was doing. And he hangs up. <laughs> so, yeah, come on. You know, at the end of that film, all the end credits, um, my accented, you know, little lines that come over. Yeah. yeah. So, well, yeah, I had a great time in the film. It was hard shooting. And Stephen King... <laughs> You know, when I told you, when I finally, the monster was something I, you know, the monster never worked. So I had to enclose myself and kill myself in the end scene after I attacked it. And finally, I mean, I was doing it one time in one take and I bit, bit one of the wings 
And in the middle of the take, I hear Stephen King, who would see come that day, saying, I can't believe it. <laughs> Warwick bit the monster. <laughs> and we had to stop and shoot that over again. Anyway, enough about yeah. that. Well, and uh, anybody who's a fan of Graveyard Shift, I'd urge you to pick up that Blu-ray from Shell Factory because it's Stephen has a really good interview on there, and the, the transfer looks amazing. Uh, well, I want to move on to another horror film you did, Amityville Horror. It's about time. Yep. Uh, this is the first of many times uh, working with Megan Ward. Uh, you worked with her many times after that. Absolutely. Uh, is, is this film what bonded your friendship with her? I think, yeah, it started there. You know, she plays my daughter in that film. Um, and so we got to know one another. We, I don't think we had too many scenes, you know, family scenes. But no. she then became sort of my love interest in General Hospital, the soap yeah. opera. And to tell you the truth, Megan Ward saved my rear end for the first week. She led me through uh, sort of how to adapt to soap opera demands of shooting. You know, you have to memorize between, I don't know, 12 and 20 pages of dialogue. And she just helped me find my way through it, through the blocking, relax. And she became, you know, we became very friendly through that uh, because she really helped me out. And I grew to really love that, that show and the demands because unlike my first attempt at soaps back away, I think it was all my children, uh, I really got to be this character and let all the edges show. I finally was able to connect with what Kirshner said and my, my acting teacher, who Milton, who used to say, you know, if you take a part and you go to the outback in Australia, you better know damn why you are taking this part. Yeah. Because you're not going to get paid enough to be there. So play that. Go there. And again, that was the character, Lansing, Trevor. Yes. It allowed me to investigate all the subtle subtleties of, you know, a guy who was out to, you know, mobster. Suave, mobster who was not afraid to kill, not afraid to take punches, anything. Anyway, I really enjoyed my experience there a lot. And Megan was a big part of that, right. helping me to adapt to that. Yeah, well, they say uh, actors who do a lot of soaps are never going to get Alzheimer's. You know, <laughs> they, they sharpen their brain memorizing somebody on it. That's apparently it, that's, that's, it was amazing. Uh, you know, simultaneously, I was I was studying to become a chaplain, a Jewish rabbi chaplain, and people used to say to me, in 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 my school, they would say, "How do you how are you learning Hebrew? You you never you don't come from a Hebrew background." And I would say. This is easy compared. You go on a soap opera set and learn 20 pages a day. Learning Hebrew is easy. <laughs> anyway. Well, I do want to, uh, we're, we're running low on time, but I do want to mention a film that uh, first made me a fan of you. Uh, I first saw you in this, a film called Transfers 3, <laughs> where, you, where you played Harris, where, uh, again, working along Megan Ward and Tim right. Robertson and Andy Robinson. Right. Uh, uh, had you seen the first two Transfers films before this? You know, I had not. No, it just came up through the agent. They said, look, they want you to play this guy. I think one, the other fellow, somebody who you represented, dropped out, couldn't do it. Yeah. That part. Art, art, yeah, Art LaFleur. Right, all right. And so, you know, I shot one here, and then they did two more in Romania. Yes. Which was a whole other trip. Um, you know, it gave me a chance to to do two there, and then I followed it up with a, a, another another film, Um what was it called? The, the, uh, you know, the kid becomes King where I played the bad guy, the, the title right. Ecl eclipses me. I forgot it, but I really enjoyed doing that because of Tim, Tim Thomerson. He's hysterical. Felt is a tremendous straight actor and an hysterical comic. He just had that mix. And he made shooting that thing just as easy as pie. Because you just sort of let him do what he wanted to do and responded to him. Uh, I played the serious guy. Right. But he lightened me up, and I just loved 
our scenes together. They were a lot of fun. I don't think I had a scene with Megan, but uh, with Tim. You did at the end of the fifth one when he comes back. You know, you're on the council, on the podium. Yes. So at the end of the fifth film. I you had a scene. Yeah. I uh, well, I want to mention Courtney Joyner. He was the, the uh, director of the third track. Right. He was, did a lot of writing for Charlie Band and Full Moon. And this was his first time directing. Do you remember him leaning on, on veteran actors for advice on set? I just remember him saying, Stephen, go out there. Do, you know, I'm, I, I'm so proud that you're here with me. And, you know, just do what you got to do. It was fine. And he'd give him my head. And again, he would pull me back here or there and shape it. But I remember him as, as really bright, really intelligent. And with a with a, a wonderful sense of humor, knowing what a jewel he had in Tim Thomerson. Yes. You know, and uh, and framing him really well. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, Courtney's an encyclopedia on film too. You know, he know he knows how to treat actors, and he knows everything they've been in. So I think that I think actors probably saw that. No, I, I I remember him, and and we you know on Facebook we're we're friends, and every once in a while we we communicate. I hope, you know, when this COVID is over, maybe sometime we can just sit down. He and I can meet again. But I do remember him clearly here. He shot uh, the one that I did here in L.A. Yes. Yeah. Then it was Nutter, David Nutter, who did those who went on to big television and movie fame. Yeah, uh, David Nutter. He won an Emmy last year for Game of Thrones. That's right. And we shot two of, of those transfers. Uh in Romania, um, that you know, so that's at, at an old abandoned Russian uh, film studio. Um, so we all met there. That was and that was a lot of fun too. Yep. Yeah, no, I'm a big Transfers fan, and uh, if anybody wants to check those out, you can get those on Full Moon streaming. All the Transfers films are on that. They have Charlie has like his own version of Netflix. That's all. <laughs> it's, it's all his films. You can subscribe there. Absolutely. Uh, Sure. Uh, well, we already we already touched on General Hospital. Uh, but you played Trevor Lansing on that popular yep. villain. Yep. Uh, and then lately, uh, you worked alongside your son Gabriel on the TV series Suits. Yeah. Uh, did you ever expect to share the screen with one of your kids? Well, we did. You know, thank God somebody believes in nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for all the years that Gabriel came up, you know, here he was going to be an actor no matter what. He just was. He, uh, he used to sing and dance when he was four and five years old. You know, just only in his underpants, he was maybe four foot tall with shocking blonde hair. And all my actor friends and writer friends used to come over and he'd get on. I don't know, he'd get it. Somehow he'd work his way onto the dining room table singing, dressed up with a towel, singing, I'm just a sweet transvestite. <laughs> He was hysterical, and you couldn't stop his impulse to act. And then it went on, and he did a he did you know a film as a young guy. Uh, why would I lie? He got the bug, and it was at that time that Suzanne and I thought it's enough. No, we don't want to. We don't want a film child. If he wants to do it, it will last through his grade school and high school. So indeed, he entered talent stuff, talent uh, contests in grade school. And he went into high school. He became, you know, really, he did all the plays. And I would coach him through that. And then he hired, he hired me when he did um, a series called The Others that Spielberg uh, had produced. Spielberg saw him um, in New York in a, he played Elvis in what's the name of that play it was an off-broadway play um i forgot but he was the guest and spielberg saw him and made him a star of a thing called the others which was a group of psychics and i played his father in that oh, no, okay. okay so when when he he got the suits he asked uh aaron if he could you know they could develop a part and they did uh, as the professor, and I have to tell you, there is no nothing greater, no more greater pleasure for me now at the age 
whatever, it was nine years ago. I'm 78 now. I was 69. To be able to stand opposite my son and say the words and play opposite him. Nothing greater. And he's a better actor, much better actor than I ever was. And he taught me a lot. Even at that time, he would say to me, and after I come back and repeat, he would say to me, Dad, I know you better than you know yourself. So all I want you to do is just say the words and look at me. Because when you talk straight, you are the most powerful and effective, emotional, intelligent man I've met. So I will tell you when it's going to be cut print. The director's not going to tell you. I'll tell you. Because they trust me. I know they think I know you better. He said, and I, no makeup. He came off. He said, you're not going to use makeup. You're not going to just look at me and talk to me. And if I give you the cue over and over again, it means I want you to say your words over and they'll keep rolling. And through the series, I learned a lot from him. Again, to let the edges show through and not do too much. Very just cool. be there. You know, that's what all these noir actors had about them. Mitchum, you know, Widmark. They did very little. Widmark more, but Mitchum did very little, but he just was who he is and allowed that to be there. So it was a great pleasure for me to rediscover that and have and to be able to play with my son, who I remember as a little boy, singing and dancing, singing all the songs from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> when, wow. you, when you when you watch him on screen, do you see a lot of your own traits in him? You know, maybe a smile, maybe maybe a smile here or there. He certainly, <laughs> as one of my when I went to my fiftieth reunion at Dartmouth College, a young a woman came up to me, a friend of. Uh, the wife of a friend of mine said, Mr. Mock, how lucky you are. Your son doesn't look anything like you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, must look like your wife. I broke up laughing. I said, you're absolutely right. He's got all her looks. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a mixture of both. I you do. Mixture, I I mixture, it's, yeah. hard. It's, it's hard for me. Uh, yeah. well, I can tell you, it's just a pleasure. That's all. It Very was a pleasure cool. the whole time. Yeah, well, many many people may not know, but uh, aside from acting, you've been doing other things. You've been wedding people and then helping bury people. <laughs> yep, I I during you know, for, on and off at soap opera, I started to take a look, and I decided you know I want to do something else and give back. And so I studied to become a rabbi, but I couldn't really meet up with the uh, Hebrew demands language. I took two years of it and intermediate. But they wanted me then to go to Israel, and I would have had to study for a couple of years abroad. So I carved my own sort of way, and I become a chaplain. And I have married over fifty couples uh, of all persuasions: wow. uh, Jews, all kinds of Jews, Christians, intermarried, uh, gays, straights. It doesn't matter. It's just a blessing to be able to do it. And I, um, I, I evolve. A, a fun, funny approach, warm, uh, heartwarming approach to this penultimate moment of marrying people. And they, uh, the couple answers 10 questions and I tell their love story out of it. And it's very hard for me. It's a lot of fun besides whatever, you know, religious elements they want. And if they want some of the Catholic tradition or a Christian tradition or a Zen tradition or a Buddhist tradition, I incorporate it all. Uh, it's cool. a privilege for me to be able to serve to unite people. And the same exists for when I bury people. I tell their story, which is full of the triumphs of who they are, some of the laughter of who they are and what they stand for. Uh, so, it, it, you know, looking back at it now at the age of 78, it is a I probably uh, am better at that than I ever was as an actor. Wow. Because I, I feel like I'm just serving other people and, and getting into who they are. And it's really caused me to reflect even more, to go deeper as an actor when those opportunities come. 
And a lot of it has to do in listening and just responding to the depth or the surface of whoever you're talking to, to be there, really be there. Anyway. Yeah, that, well, that's, that's interesting. You know, it gives you good balance between acting and uh, real life. Absolutely. Well, yep. the last question I want to ask you, uh, I ask everybody that I talk to, sure. uh, it's a little cliche, but I love hearing the answer. Uh, if you could, uh, if you could star in a film and pick one actor to star alongside you and one director to direct the film, oh, who would you pick? And the, there's two caveats. People have to be alive and they have to be people you've never worked with before. Oh my God. Well, I certainly, you know, my favorite act is it like Bobby Duval, uh, De Niro, those two, I mean, I really, uh, because they are, they're everything that I've been talking about. Yeah. So I would love to do something. I would love to act with them in, in a way. And sure to have, even though I've worked with my son, I'd like to have him there to, to appreciate the aged wine. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, um, I don't know which, uh, any of the great directors, really any of the great directors, but the directors who are really, you know, Scorsese, I think it's too too late now, but a director in that vein, who's just interested in the edges of who people are and what causes, what causes people to act the way they do and then to discover that they made all kinds of errors about their lives and make some kind of attempt at reversing those errors. Where's that script? I think I, I think I missed the opportunity to do that when Gene Roddenberry asked me to be Picard because I was too young and I, I refused him. I said, I don't want to do it. He said, why not? I said, because I don't want to talk to guys with 10 heads. He said, it's not about that. I said, what's it about? He said, there's, there's stories Picard is Moses going into the desert, leading the forefront, leading people out. They're free, and yet in space, every in the desert, in space, all of the problems that they had, even as they were slaves, pop up. How are you going to solve those things? How are you going to take a look at that? I said, what? That's not what I see there. He said, but that's what it's about. So what I'm saying is, real scripts that are like that. That's what I would like to do, certainly at my age now, because I feel I'm sort of at that time to right. take a look at something like that. Uh, you know, a combination of noir and what's happening right now. Um, you know, I love the political thrillers that are, that are being made now. Uh, Aaron Sorkin, I would love to work for him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great director. Yep. yep. Well, Stephen, it's always fun talking to you. We could go on forever, but uh, we're we're over an hour here. But no uh, boy. you know, it's it's always a joy talking to you. Always good seeing you. So thanks for spending the time with me today. I appreciate it, Dom. Thanks very much, and for all you people, thanks for uh, tuning in. And uh, I hope sometime we'll get to meet one on one. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, uh, we still have sales open. If you'd like to have your own five minute conversation with Stephen on Zoom. You can go over and book that on fullempirepromotions.com right now. So uh, thanks, Stephen. We'll see you later. My pleasure. See you later, everybody. Thanks a lot. Uh, what a great guy. Thanks so much to everyone who watched. As you, as you can see, Stephen has endless stories about his career, uh, too many to fit into one Q&A. But uh, if you'd like to have your own, go over and book your Zoom session. You'll have a good time talking to him. And I'm also excited to announce that uh, several – uh, other clients are going to be having digital fan events, including tomorrow night at 4 p.m. We'll be on with Barbara Crampton, a reanimator, and uh, Sunday, Terry Kaiser, the star of Weekend at Bernie's. And then next weekend, we're hosting three other events with Nicholas Lee from The X-Files, uh, Ian McCulloch from Lutrio Fulci Zombie, and Evil Dead 2 star Cassie DePaiva. So all for all that information, go over to fullempirepromotions.com. We also have private signings coming up with uh, Rick Domeyer from Evil Dead 2 and Daniel Stern. 
and so many exciting things. Uh, hopefully we see you on the road soon. I know everybody's anxious to get back, uh, but uh, we'll have to do it when it's safe and uh, hopefully at the end of this year. So once again, thanks for watching, everybody, and uh, hope we'll, hopefully we'll see you in the Zoom with Stephen. Thanks so much.